Jesus. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship.
body to you are. This morning, this morning, as we join together to worship Jesus Christ, our King of Kings and our Lord of Lords, He is the way maker. He is the promise keeper. He is the light in the darkness. And He is the way, the truth, and the life. And for us today, this message, I give you the four points at the very beginning before we sing this next song. There are important words that I hope will resonate in your life every day this week. Work! Run! Pursue! Enjoy! They're all important, and we're all going to see them in the second book of Timothy. And these words can transform your life. And I promise you, not the same word will impact the same people. They're four different words, and they're going to impact everybody in a different way, and there's going to be a certain word that's going to hit you harder than somebody else. But I promise you, if you allow Jesus Christ to work in and through your life right now, and you ask God to be the battle winner of every battle that you face this week, if you let God transform your life, it can transform who you are this week. As I think about this and I look at it, I, I want to remind you uh, before we... I, I don't know if everyone will know this next song, but I, I just think it goes so well, uh, even with the Joshua that's coming up on Wednesday, to think about finding reassurance in the midst of a battle. Has anybody faced a battle in the last year of their life? Anybody? Anybody? Can I get an amen out there? I mean, I'm just going to tell you right now, I struggled with getting my hair done right today. I know nobody knows, but I did. And uh, there was this one little spot right there. It wouldn't cut. <laughs> I mean, I know nobody was going to see it, but it just is bothersome. Everybody's... I know, I know it's a big issue for people, and they don't know how, how burdensome that is, but <laughs> there's bigger battles out there, isn't it? And I promise you, the battle that you face is not yours. But we treat it as if it's our battle. We treat it as if it's only going to be won or lost because of us. And it won't be. It's only won or lost because of God. So when we look at Joshua chapter 1, that will be Wednesday, uh, that will be on Facebook uh, and, and the YouTube channel. I also want to encourage uh, each and every one of you to know that to, to continue being faithful with God's tithes. It is something that Heather and I decided 23, almost 24 years ago when we first got married she was still going to school. Uh, I was in my electronics job, and we made the determination then, before I'd been called to be a pastor, we were going to be faithful to God and the tithes that He puts into our presence and the money that we have. We're going to be faithful, and, and we have strived every year of our life, no matter what, to be faithful to God in and through this. I promise you, I promise you, God gives blessings in ways that we don't see. And when we're not faithful to the one who is faithful, we miss out on the blessings that God wants to give that are not financial. It's not about finances. It's about a walk with Him. So for all those who continue to be faithful to God in their, in their giving of His tithe and then anything above that of their offerings, such as last week we got enough money to send another water well to India. So we have, as a church, had one family to donate enough to do one well. And then as a church, we've raised enough to to do another water well, uh, and then last week or the week before, our family 
uh, still has seven mills to go, but we went on and sent the money. Uh, so we still have seven mills to do. Uh, we had someone else to do something very kind uh, for us and would not accept money. Uh, money goes towards that water well because God wants to use you. So I ask in this moment, if you would, to just say these words. Work. Yeah, nobody likes that word. Run. Yeah, nobody likes that word either. Pursue. Oh, we're going to get this one. Enjoy. Yeah, you guys don't get it yet, but you will get it here pretty soon. So in and through this, I want you to think about the reality of whose purpose and plan are you following. Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you that you are the way maker. And Lord, I pray that we understand that the battle belongs to you. Lord, help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. And for those online, Lord, if, if, if they want to stand, if they want to kneel, if they want to sit, Lord, whatever it is, may their hearts bow before you. Lord, for us who are here in person, I pray that we find ourselves, whether we stand or sit, kneel, whatever it is, that our focus is upon you. Lord, help us to relinquish the battles of our life and let you have full control of everything. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. When all I see is the mountain, you see a mountain move. And as I walk through the shadow, your life surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe. So when I fight, I fight on my knees With my hands lifted I Oh God, the battle belongs to you And every fear I lay at your feet I'll sing through the night And oh God, the battle belongs to you Before us, nothing 
can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. So when I fight, I fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Belongs to you, and every fear I lay at your feet. I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And oh God, the battle belongs to you. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Nothing in this world you could ever satisfy Through every trial my soul will sing No turning back, I've been set free Christ is enough for me Everything I need is in you Everything I need Christ my all in all The joy my salvation Heaven is my home Through every storm My soul will sing Jesus is here To God be the glory And Christ is enough for me Christ is enough for me Decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me, no turning.
no turning back, no turning back. There is a saying that when we set a goal of life, that you need to work towards that goal. And once you get to that goal and you achieve it, you need to celebrate that goal. But the fact is, you need to set a new goal. If we live our life based on what we did and not what we're doing, we will never move forward with where we can be. And for us today, as we look at today's message and we look at this passage of Scripture, and I've already said it and I want you to think about it, but the battle that you've been facing in your life or the battle you have faced, the battle you're getting ready to face in your life, you think it's your battle. And it's a lie from Satan. The greatest lie Satan wants us to believe is that he doesn't exist. There is no greater lie in the world that we live in than the fact of people saying there is no such thing as the devil. If he can get you to believe there is no such thing as the devil, then obviously the next step is there is no such thing as God. And we go down this path and and we live our life as if God doesn't matter in it. And if God... If, the, if Satan and the devil can get you to the place in your life that, he, that you think the battle belongs to you, that the battle you face is yours, that you are the one in charge of how you're going to do in that battle, you will lose. I promise you I'm not smart enough, I'm not strong enough, I'm not fast enough, I'm not wise enough, I'm not big enough to beat Satan. I cannot do it. And anybody that thinks they're going to face Satan and do it, they're lying to themselves. He's bigger than you. He's stronger than you. He's faster than you. He's smarter than you. And he will tell you lies long enough and loud enough that you will start believing them yourself. The only reason... I am able to stand here today is because of the blood of Jesus Christ on that cross that he shed for me and the calling on my life to pick up the armor of God, every piece of it that we talked about last week. So I read from 2 Timothy chapter 2 where it reads, Work hard. So you can present yourself to God and receive his approval. Be a good worker, one who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly explains the word of truth. Sometimes I will put a different version up and in this version here it reads, Do your best, work hard, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. There is a call on every one of our lives today that we look and we understand that in and through that, God wants you to work hard. Everybody say that word, work! Work. What are we working at? See, the reality is, is that for us today, the work he wants you to do is to present yourself to God as one approved of God. What happens is, is that many times I hear people say that I can't come to church. I can't come to God. I got to get my life straightened out first. You ain't going to do it. You can't do it. Won't happen. This is not, I'm taking this battle on myself. So the reality is, is that God takes you where you are and he works with you and moves you to where he wants you to be. Now, I speak of this truth. I call it truth. It's a reality. I grew up on a farm. So when I talk about this, everybody, I'm talking from a farmer's perspective, a country boy. Okay. If you're a country person and you don't like what I'm getting ready to say and you say it's offensive, I question if you're a country person. Oh, 
Oh, Josh, hang with me. When I grew up, I didn't wear shoes 95% of the time, all right? I mean, thistles, briar bushes, going through stuff. Sometimes I didn't even have a shirt on, just shorts running through all this stuff, right? When you would come home at the end of the day, if a water hose wasn't required before you were allowed to come in and take a shower, you probably wasn't a country boy. That's how I know. Now, my mom loved me, but she wasn't letting me in her house. Not like that. The other day, Heather got a phone call and said, uh, the person said, I, I got some dolls. Would, would Grace love to have these dolls so she could play with the dolls? Heather goes, well, I'm looking out the door right now, and she's got a blanket uh, that's got a hole in it that's draped over her head that's down to where now it's like this shirt thing, and she's physically in the mud by the, the house thing. I don't... Unless she wants to put the dolls in the mud, she's not going to want the dolls. She's muddy, right? So what do I do? I go out there and say, don't you ever get in the mud again. No. You got to get cleaned up. So I'm going to take you where you are in your muddy mess. But I don't want to leave you there. I want to move you to the place that there's, that there's this cleaning process before you keep moving forward. So this idea that I have accepted Jesus Christ means that he's going to come wherever I am. I promise you, no matter what you've done, no matter how much of a muddy mess you are, no matter how big the water hose, I used to drink out of that same water hose. Clean up, drink, clean up, drink, right? That's country, that's country. And I'm just telling you, it, country people will survive, right? So... I'm not talking about city people. If you want to, you, you get on the side of the water when it rains, right? You're not going to get a muddy mess on the side, right? So you, you understand God's going to take you where you are. But you have to work. See, he doesn't take you where you are for you to stay right where you are. He wants you to be presentable in a point that you understand that he wants you to be a good worker for who? Not one who is ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of Jesus Christ. There are some people who accepted Jesus Christ years ago and have never expressed the love of God and the understanding of the gospel to one single person in their life. They're afraid. They're afraid they're not good enough. They're afraid they're not smart enough. And God tells us we need to work. We need to work and not be ashamed, and we need to explain the truth of God's Word, especially in a generation who is canceling culture. We're in this moment to where soon, if certain things pass, I'm going to say and I'm going to be fined because I say those things. I promise you. I'm telling you, I'm standing here, and everybody's going to hear it. If it's in God's holy word, it's going to be spoken of as truth, and it's going to be spoken of in love. And I will not waver in that. And for us, each and every day, does that mean I have to work harder? I do have to work harder. And there's something in it that says, what are you going to do to show that you are approved? So we say that word one more time. You at home, say it. Work. No, the people at home, guys, come on. <laughs> yeah, are you ready? Ready? People at home, are you wishing you were at home? Just okay. People at home, say it. Work. Did y'all hear them? I didn't hear a word they said. Do you guys say work? Work. work. I want you to work. I want you to work. I want you to work. Uh, the Bible goes on and tells us something intriguing: avoid worthless, foolish talk that only leads to more godless behavior. This kind of talk spreads like cancer, as in the case of these two people. I mean, let's think about this. Bad news travels faster and lasts longer than good news. Guaranteed, mark it down. A couple of weeks ago, I told you I was taking a stand on the Word of God, 
and I was speaking up saying a certain pastor was saying lies about God's word. You realize that pastor's talk made it onto national radio. Do you think me standing up for what the word of God said made it to national radio? No. Why? Because a lie will go farther, untruths will go farther, bad news will go faster than good news. So we keep doing this. Why? Because these bad things will spread like that. I think about the time that uh, my people, my grandfather, I call him people, um, got tongue cancer. And they had to go in and surgically remove a third of his tongue. And, and I remember that as a kid. And then later on, I don't even remember the time frame, but later on he had more cancer show back up so they had to take another third of his tongue off. After that one, like that, it spread everywhere. And it wasn't long that my people was no longer. See, bad news will always spread faster. That's why we have to work hard in this current generation to spread the good news. We have to work hard every day to tell other people about the love of God because this foolish talk, these things will take over so quickly. And the foolish talk they had in that day, they have left the path of truth claiming that the resurrection of the dead has already occurred. In this way, they have turned some people away from the faith. Why do we work hard? Because ultimately I don't want to turn anyone away from the faith. I want to speak the truth of God's word in love. To realize there is grace and mercy in our life. To realize there is peace that overwhelms. The Bible goes on and Paul continues writing to young Timothy and says, But God's truth stands firm like a foundation stone with this inscription, The Lord knows those who are His, and all who belong to the Lord must turn away from evil. In a wealthy home, some utensils are made of gold and silver, and some are made of wood and clay. The expensive utensils are used for special occasions, and the cheap ones are for everyday use. If you keep yourself pure, you will be a special utensil for honorable use. Your life will be clean, and you will be ready for the master to use you for every good work. Here's what I want you to know. God has a purpose and a plan for your life. He wants you to be a special utensil for the glory of God. That thing that says, I am called to do this for the glory of God and I'm the one who's supposed to do this, me can't call up the preacher and say, hey, preacher, you do this. It's not the preacher's calling. It's my calling. It's when I've been working hard to present myself to God to say, God, here I am. Use me. Use me. We have for almost 24 years now had these special plates and glasses that Somebody in our marriage group between Heather and I, and I won't say which one did this, but one at these special plates, right? Expensive. They were expensive to us. I, they probably aren't. They're probably like nothing big or nothing, but they're like expensive to us. They never get used. Ever. Why? Because we're waiting on a special occasion. What's the special occasion? I don't know. I haven't figured that out yet. Now, I know you guys are thinking immediately as my wife who wanted those. Maybe. I will never say. But the fact is, God wants to use you. And for some, for many, you don't think you're that special. You don't think there's any way you're anything more than just a common 
utensil in the drawer. You're nothing special. You're not smart enough. You're not big enough. You're not fast enough. You're not wise enough. You don't have enough gifts or talents. And you think I'm not special. And you don't allow God to use you either. It's a lie. If you keep yourself pure and you keep working hard to present yourself to God, God wants to use you. You are fearfully and wonderfully made in His image. You are created new in Christ Jesus and you are a masterpiece of God's hand, and He wants to use you. So I read this all-important verse here, and we spend a little bit of time talking about it. Run from anything that stimulates youthful lust. Instead, pursue righteous living, faithfulness, love, and peace. Enjoy the companionship of those who call on the Lord with pure hearts. Run. Who here wants to go for a run after church? Nobody. You know the greatest thing about running a race is when you get to stop. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, the last time I ran a 5K was when we were doing it here as a church and we did that run for God and I'm running. And, you know, that's been, what, five years ago, four years ago, three? I don't know. I lost track of time. But I know I'm running. I'm about halfway, right? So say it's five years ago. I'm 45 years old. I mean, this 70-year-old woman and her grandchild, I, she may have been 65. Do you know how old she was? How old? 65. I, yeah, I, I, I'm set. In my book, when I'm halfway through a 5K and a 65-year-old runs by me, I'm calling her 70, okay? I knew in my mind, I was like, I want to quit. And when I saw her coming up and I looked over and I saw her, I was like, good gracious. It came out of my mouth and out, out loud. Good gracious. Good for you. You go, girl. That's what I said. I was like, there's no way I'm keeping up with this woman. Look at her go, and she left me. If there was dust to be had, I would have had it all over me from her. And what brought me more comfort than anything was knowing that Heather was farther behind me than that. So I knew that woman had passed her up too. And I thought, well, hey, if she passed up the 35-year-old, then she, hey, it's not that bad, right? So the problem is, is I want to quit running. But there's something God wants to do through you. And the reality is, is you got to figure out what you're running away from. Some people are running in life, and they're running away from stuff that God's saying it's time to stop and relinquish these things and stop running away from them. One of my greatest fears, fear is probably the wrong word, but that's the word I'm going to use. One of my greatest fears uh, in the ministry is that I ever become driven to be successful that the things I do is about a success. To think about, I see other pastors, I see other things that are happening, I see things that I desire in life and how I want them to be in the ministry, that it ever becomes about success-driven. It's a struggle because I never want that to be the cause, but if you're, if you're really honest with yourself, early on in my ministry, I did like a lot of preachers before me after the sermon they'd say amen and the preacher would be in the back and then everybody would filter out and they'd shake their hand right and what I started noticing I'm just making up a number but say there's a hundred people walk through they all shake your hand they're all going good sermon preacher good oh, you did such a good job you know and then that one person walks by and they just shake your hand they don't say anything they just shake your hand don't really look you in the eye Everybody else, good job, good job, good job. And then when you get in the vehicle, who do you think you're thinking about? They didn't say something. Did I do something? Did they not like it? What, what was it my, what, what, what? Have you ever had that happen? Everybody's telling you, good job, good job, good job. Somebody else comes along and goes, eh. I mean, there was one time in my life I thought I did the best sermon of my life. 
I mean, I'm up there preaching it going, in my mind, this is early on. I'm like, this is the best sermon I've ever preached. There's not a lot of them to choose from. I'm like, I nailed this one. We get out in the car and I couldn't wait. I looked over at my loving, dearing, humble wife, who is always there to love and support. I looked over at her and I said, well, what'd you think about that one, honey? She goes, well, wasn't one of your better ones. There was silence in heaven for about 30 minutes, which was the drive that I had all the way back home. We said nothing. I didn't ask her how I did on a sermon for about a year. Well, I don't even care what you say. <laughs> Why? Because we all want to be liked. Part of youthful lust, we always immediately think about certain categories but there's so many more things to youthful things that we desire in life that we call important paul says you need to run away from those things your success is not what i'm after i'm looking to use you as a utensil for the goodness and the glory of me god says so i want to use this so you have to run and within all of us we want to stop running I think about Bradley. He's been coming home talking about he wants to run because everybody at school says that he can run really fast, so they, they want him. The teachers are telling him and all this, and he says, every time we run, Dad, I beat them. I beat the other kids. I beat the other kids. You know. And in my loving way, I look at him. I go, do they know they're racing you? Or are you all just all running around, and then you pass them, and they don't even know? I need to know these things. Like, I mean, are you really good? Or are you just, hey, I'm going to beat them. And they're like, they don't even know they're racing. <laughs> I, encouragement is my greatest gift, guys. It is. So he decides he's going to run one mile. And so we show him where the one mile is. True story. And, and I didn't ask permission for this, but it'll end, it'll, it'll end okay for you, Bradley. So he takes off. And I, and I time it. And he takes off. And I mean, he takes off. I yell, I go, oh, slow down, buddy. You can't, slow down. You ain't going to make that pace. Like, boom, he's going. And I go, hey, he can't keep that pace. I mean, if he can keep that pace, we're putting him in world challenges if he comes back at that pace. So it gets about the time that I'm thinking, I'm going to see him coming back. No Bradley. A minute later goes by, no Bradley. A minute later goes by. No, Bradley. I'm like, okay, now we're starting to get to the time the 50-year-old man may should start showing up. If he ain't coming over top that hillside in a minute, he may have fallen in a ditch somewhere. Next thing you know, I see him. And when I see him, the six foot three boy is standing about five foot seven. And he's running like this, right? Like you, just everything in him is like, I want to quit. And I take my hand, I'm standing outside on the, on the, on the deck and, and I'm on the porch and I'm, and I'm slamming my, I start slamming my hand on the, on the porch. Boom, boom, boom. And I see his head kind of come up and I go, come on, Bradley, you got it. Come on, man, keep going. Don't stop. His five foot seven starts coming back up to six foot and he's running. But I promise you, he's struggling and I get louder and louder. You got this. You got this. He gets to the end and he's going for all he's worth. Of course, Mitchell at that time gets to the edge of the yard. I know, Mitchell, you're in the story. So as, he, as Bradley's going by, Mitchell darts by him like, like Bradley's not even moving. Mitchell beats him to the finish line, right? But here's the deal. I promise you, Bradley wanted to quit. But his demeanor changed when he started hearing someone cheer for him. And he knew there was a finish line ahead. I say that because I want to say this first and then I'll go back to this. We're running away from something, but you need to pursue something. Bradley's goal was to get to the finish line so he could stop. Your goal is to pursue something beggar, bigger, righteous living. Pursue faithfulness. Pursue love. 
pursue peace. See, when we're running away from the things this world wants to give us, the things we strive for, the things we want, and when we have to run away from those things, it's going to be this natural pull to keep you there. It's going to want to keep turning you back. So you're not just running away from this stuff. You're running towards something. You are now in pursuit. You don't ever stop pursuing. You don't ever stop pursuing. And I promise you, the angels in heaven, the heavenly beings, God's holy people are cheering you on. And they are saying, keep running, keep working, keep pursuing. Because ultimately, you need to enjoy life. And you need to enjoy it with the companionship of those who call on the Lord with pure hearts. I give you two examples of companionship. In my life, there is no greater companion for me than my wife. There is none. It's not even close. The love that she has for God, the love that she has for our children and our family, the pursuit of what she is and what she desires for God, so much alike in me and the, what we're going after, to continue being there for each other. And I give you another one. Over the last year as a church, you guys have come to know Evan Rubia through song. There has been no greater companion in my life over the last year than Evan Rubia. Nobody. It's not even a close second. I say that because there are people in your life that you need to have around you that have a like passion, a like love, a like purity of heart that lifts you up. There are people in my life that I've had to take steps back from because their influence on my life is not a help. It is a distraction. It is a detriment. And it is one that does nothing but pull me down and pulls me into arguments in my mind, bitterness in my heart. And there's that moment that you have to take those steps back. But what we have to realize in taking those steps back is we don't abandon those people totally. What we realize is, is that they're not the ones that I'm going to find my enjoyment with. So I have to work. I have to work hard to present myself to God. I have to run from the things that I desire in life and I have to pursue the things God desires for my life. Right living, faithfulness, love, peace. And I need to enjoy the companionship of someone that is like-minded in love. See, how do we make it through? A year ago, I would have said double-stuffed Oreo cookies would have been in that top three, right? <laughs> and it would have been. And double-stuffed Oreo cookies was my best friend. They didn't argue with me. They didn't do nothing but delight, to provide me with deliciousness. That's it. No arguing. You get a bag full. When it's gone, there was more bags to be had. Why? There's an endless supply. But for some of us, we spend our time trying to find the enjoyment of the wrong person in our life. And we haven't chosen very wisely whom we enjoy to be around. So he goes on and he says, again, I say, don't get involved in foolish, ignorant arguments that only starts fight, start fights, you know, such as in the comment section of Facebook post. <laughs> you ever read those things? You know you do. Sometimes I don't even read the post. Just skip to the comments. They're the geniuses in there, all the comments, right? And they just start back and forth and everybody wanting, uh, 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 uh. Josh, you don't know what I'm talking about, do you? Not on Facebook. A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but must be kind to everyone, be able to teach, and be patient with difficult people. So those people that I take a step back from, I realize that i got to work all the more harder 
to present myself as a tool, a utensil for the glory of God. I have to run away from my passions and I have to pursue what God wants and I have to remember to enjoy the people God has placed in my life. Why? Because I said that there's a purpose and a plan that the devil has and I haven't talked about him until now as far as that goes. And it says, gently instruct those who oppose the truth. Perhaps God will change those people's hearts and they will learn the truth. And then he says this. Then they will come to their senses and escape from the devil's trap. For they have been held captive by him to do whatever he wants. If you stop working for the glory of God... The devil's pulling you into his trap. If you stop running away from youthful lust, the devil is ensnaring you into his trap. If you stop pursuing righteousness, peace, love, if you stop pursuing those things, the devil is setting you up in his trap. If you do not enjoy companionship with someone else of a pure heart and it doesn't have to be a spouse I gave you my spouse as an example and someone on the other side of the world as my examples that doesn't mean they're the only two people in my life they're just the most influential in the last year but Satan has robbed the other people and he's lying to them and they don't think they need the Lord. For some of us, we think the battle belongs to us. And I can do it on my own. You can't. See, not only do I need the Lord, but I need people like Heather and Evan in my life. And you have to choose who's in your life. And you need that one, two, three people in your life that keeps you going up towards God not dragging you down. You don't abandon all the people dragging you down. You take a step back and you realize I'm a utensil for the glory of God for them. No longer do I need their approval in my life. I need the person in my life that's going to love God and help me move towards that. Ultimately, we all need the Lord. As this song is played, Pray that maybe you kneel where you are, maybe you stand, maybe you sit. Maybe you find a spot down here and, and you pray. But ask God, what do I need, God? I need you and you above everything.
Discipleship call on your life this week. So I want you to read 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 15 through 26 every day. And I have moved the reflect, listen, pray from the side of that picture to the middle because I want you to read it, not just to read it, but I want you to reflect on what it says. I want you to listen to what it says, and then I want you to pray about what it says. And then I want you to ask that very important question, what needs transforming in your life? What word in there needs to be transformed into your life? What, what verse in there needs to have it transformed into your life? What part of it? Find someone that you can speak to with this that's on a like level uh, of yours and, and say in your mind, what is that thing that needs to transform in my life? In and through this life, it's going to be tough, but God has a purpose and a plan for your life, and He loves you. Take this week to allow this verse, these verses, to transform your life. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you His favor and give you His peace as you pursue after that peace. It's in the name of our loving Heavenly Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, that I make this prayer and proclamation to you this day. Amen.